Good morning and a very warm welcome indeed to you all to this, our Cranmer Group online service on the third Sunday of Lent, March the 7th. It's great to have you with us this morning. I'm the Reverend Tim Chambers, if we haven't met. Uh, I hope to be able to meet you in person at some point soon. I'm the vicar of the six churches and villages here in our Cranmer Group. Before we start our service this morning, let's bow our heads in silence before our loving God. The Lord be with you and also with you. The collect for today from Common Worship. Eternal God, give us insight to discern your will for us to give up what harms us, and to seek the perfection we are promised in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Deb Hubbard is now going to play for us uh, a new uh, worship song for the vast majority of us, I imagine, uh, Most Merciful God. It's a composition by one of my contemporaries from my curate training here in the diocese, Chris Pierce, who is vicar up in Farnsfield and surrounding villages these days. And it's a song that's particularly appropriate for this Lenten season. Thank you, Deb. Thank you so much, Deb. Annie Dickinson is now going to read to us from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 4. Thank you, Annie. The reading is taken from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 4. The wall defended against enemies. 
It so happened that Sanballat heard that we were, we were rebuilding the wall and he was furious and very indignant and he mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish? Stones that are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and he said, Whatever they build, if even a fox goes up on it, he'll break down their stone wall. Ah, hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn their reproach on their own heads and give them as plunder to a land of captivity. Do not cover their iniquity and do not let their sin be blotted out from before you, for they've provoked you to anger before the builders. So we built the wall and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored, restored and the gaps were being closed, that they became very angry and all of them conspired to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. Nevertheless, we made our prayer to our God and because of them, we set watch against them day and night. Then Judah said, the strength of the labourers is failing. There's so much rubbish that we're not able to build the wall. And our adversaries said, they will neither know nor see anything until we come into their midst and kill them and cause the work to seek. cease. So it was, when the Jews who dwelt near them came, that they told us ten times, from whatever place you turn, they will be upon us. Therefore, I positioned, positioned men behind the lower parts of the wall, at the openings, and I set the people according to their families, with their swords, their spears and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the leaders and to the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord great and awesome and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives and your houses. And it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had brought their plot to nothing that all of us returned to the wall, everyone to his work. So it was from that time on that half of my servants worked at construction, while the other half held the spears, the shields, the bows, and they wore armour, and the leaders were behind all the house of Judah. Those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction and with other they held a weapon. Every one of the builders had his sword girded at his sight as he built and the one who sounded the trumpet was beside me. Then I said to the nobles, the rulers and the rest of the people, the work is great and extensive and we are separated far from one another on the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us. Our God will fight for us. So we laboured in the work and half the men held the spears from daybreak until the stars appeared. At the same time, I also said to the people, let each man and his servant stay at night in Jerusalem, that they may be our guard by night and a working party by day. So neither I, my brethren, my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me took off our clothes, except that everyone 
took them off for washing. This is the end of the reading. Thanks be to God. Thank you so much, Annie, for your really dramatic reading of our passage from Nehemiah this morning and a rather easier one for you this week after last week's uh, challenging catalogue of names in Nehemiah 3. Thank you. Lord, I pray that you will be in my words and in our hearts and minds this morning and you will speak to each one of us in power. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're continuing our Lent season of sermons from the book of Nehemiah. And this morning we've reached chapter four, where things take a rather different turn. Last week we heard how, uh, just like the people of Nehemiah's Jerusalem, we in our Cranmer group of churches have been placed in our communities to build here. God calls each one of us today, like Nehemiah's wall builders two and a half thousand years ago, to step out, believing that we all have something to give, to step up uh, with everyone playing their part and to step together, not as six individual churches, but as one united Cranmer group building his kingdom in this place in unity with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Last Sunday, all seemed to be going really well for Nehemiah and God's people in Jerusalem. He's come so far from his original vision for God's people and God's city. Day by day, stone by stone, the walls are growing once again to their full height. But then things start to go sour. Nehemiah and God's people, as they labour on these walls, begin to encounter opposition. Just as we considered last week what scripture might be telling us in the story of Nehemiah about the nature of God's call on us to build his kingdom in this place, in this time, it's worth pausing for a moment now to reflect on the opposition that those who follow God's call on their lives, and that includes each one of us, will face. Jesus is clear to his disciples in John chapter 15 that since they've been chosen by him, they will be hated. If they persecuted me, he says to them, they will persecute you also. We too can expect opposition. Indeed, to encounter opposition is an intrinsic part of what it is to be a Christian. This certainly isn't a claim that this sort of opposition uh, is the same in all parts of the world at all times. We're only too aware at this moment as Pope Francis makes his historic visit to stand in solidarity with our Christian brothers and sisters in Iraq, that the level of opposition and persecution that they face there is of a completely different order of magnitude and physical danger to anything that we might encounter here in the UK. Nevertheless, at some point in our Christian journeys, all of us will have faced, will be facing, or will come to face opposition to the faith that we profess. It's in the nature of our desire to follow the ways of God and in our seeking to bring about something of his kingdom here on earth. It's in the nature of that that we'll encounter spiritual opposition in the form of the enemy. In Jesus' words in John 10.10, 10, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. The thief, the enemy comes only to steal and kill and destroy. So this morning, as we consider in the story of Nehemiah what it is to encounter opposition, we do so recalling all those in many parts of the world where to profess Jesus is Lord is to face a very real risk of death, imprisonment or persecution. Let's hold them in prayer for a moment now, praying especially 
for their safekeeping. Let's turn to the detail of Nehemiah's story and to chapter 4, where we find a name cropping up again from earlier in the book. Back in chapter 2, right at the very start of the rebuilding of the walls, Nehemiah named three figures, Sanballat, Tobiah and Geshem, who mocked and ridiculed him and his fellow Israelites as they began their task. Why were they bothering to waste their time and energy rebuilding Jerusalem's shattered walls? But by the time we encounter Sambalat again at the start of this morning's reading, the picture has changed substantially. Nehemiah and his fellow Jews have rebuilt the walls to almost half their original height. Sambalat who was a high-ranking official of the Persian Empire, in charge of much of the region around Jerusalem. Now, he, with his cronies, felt threatened by what Nehemiah had achieved, even with this initial partial rebuilding. If Jerusalem were restored to even a fraction of its former glory, then the power that Sambalat and Tobiah and their allies uh, wielded would shrink dramatically. So they react and they use all of the jeering insults that they can muster against Nehemiah and his fellow Jewish wall builders. Sambalat criticises them in just about every way you could think of to undermine and to discourage all that they are doing. He attacks their character. They are feeble Jews. He attacks their abilities. Will they ever restore that wall? He believes they'll never finish it. Will they ever get to offer sacrifices to the Lord in his temple again? He attacks their stickability. Will they finish in a day? He attacks the work's feasibility. It's impossible. How can those heaps of rubble be turned into, into walls once again? And then Weasley Tobiah pipes up too to attack their competence. Even a fox would break down the wall were it to climb up upon it. Sanballat and Tobiah, in all their name-calling, which all the builders can hear from their stations on the walls, do their worst to discourage God's people from the vision that he has placed in their hearts. Have you ever encountered this, I wonder? When you really feel that God's placed a burden on your heart for a kingdom purpose and then you're greeted with others' ridicule, even as you do your very best to follow God's calling on your life. It's so easy to feel discouraged, isn't it? To question ourselves whether what we thought we'd heard from God was right in the first place, whether to throw in the towel right now. This is just what's happening to Nehemiah and his fellow Jews. And then it gets worse for them. When Sambalat's taunts don't seem to be having an effect, he tells the surrounding tribes about what's happening uh, with the walls. And they all gather their armies to come against Nehemiah, to destroy the new fortifications and to slaughter all the builders and their families. This is the first form of opposition that Nehemiah encounters, hostility, mockery, violence. But then there comes a second form of opposition, more insidious and perhaps even more dangerous than the first sort, discouragement and fear. We read in verse 10 of chapter 4 that confronted by all of this, the Jews become tired. They feel there's just so much to do. They just can't do uh, what they've set out to achieve. And it's so common for us to feel like that, especially in the middle of something big, when our initial enthusiasm has waned, but we don't yet have the renewed energy and momentum that comes from having the finish line in sight. Apparently, this is exactly what runners in Nottingham's Robin Hood Marathon feel like 
Uh, I've only done the half, uh, so I don't know uh, the full details of this, but people tell me it's the case. Uh, between mile 13 and mile 22, the route goes out first to Colic Park and then to Home Pierpont to the National Water Sports Centre, where the wind whips up and there are no spectators cheering you on. It's so easy to become really discouraged on that part of the course. You have to push through and get back to where the crowds are and where the finish line seems tangibly close. It's so easy in those places to feel like giving up. And then other Jews, uh, the allies from the towns and the villages surrounding Jerusalem say to the wall builders, uh, not encouraging and strengthening words, but they too start to talk of throwing in the towel. Leave all that hard work on the walls. Come with us to where you're in less danger. They think that they're being well-meaning and compassionate towards the builders in Jerusalem. But their siren calls actually oppose what God has called those builders to do. All of this opposition seems to have become too much. But Nehemiah responds and he turns the situation around. How, I wonder, does he go about this? And what can we learn from him in our own Christian walk, individually and collectively, as he does? Given what we've already seen of Nehemiah's previous response, of prayer and action hand in hand, of his confidence in God's sovereignty alongside human responsibility, it's no surprise, really, to see that his response to opposition is along the same lines. Nehemiah's first response is prayer. In verses 4 and 5, Nehemiah prays. But I think that his prayer can take us aback a bit. To be honest, it's pretty brutal, like some of the, uh, of the Psalms, um, uh, where they, uh, they ask God to send judgment on his, Nehemiah's, enemies. So I think it's important to say two things about that prayer here. Firstly, I think the fact that it is there and the fact that similar prayers are in the Psalms mean that it is okay for us to express to God the full depth and the full rawness of the pain that's in our hearts when something uh, goes wrong for us, when someone uh, strives against us in the way that Sambalat and the troops are doing against Nehemiah. We can do this knowing that God will not necessarily do what we ask him to do in our, um, in our rawness, but that he does hear us and he'll respond to our prayers in his often far more appropriate ways. And secondly, we can see in this episode that although Nehemiah in many ways points us towards the figure of Jesus, this prayer is a reminder that Nehemiah is not Jesus. In contrast to Nehemiah, Christ, when he is nailed to the cross, prays to his father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Nehemiah isn't Jesus. So for us, as for Nehemiah, whenever we face opposition and discouragement, let our first response be prayer, whatever the circumstances we're in. And then having prayed, Nehemiah acts. His response is intensely practical. He presses on and in particular does three things. First of all, Nehemiah reminds the people who God is. In verse 14, he stands up in front of the crowd and declares, Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome. At times like this, we too need to turn our eyes to God and to the extraordinary things that he has done. So reading in our Bibles the stories of his providence and love and sharing the stories of Christian women and men who've gone before us, 
and of how God has moved in their lives. And indeed, reminding ourselves of what he has done in our lives too. Secondly, Nehemiah arms the people and has them ready to fight. In verse 16, we read that uh, he sends some to be armed on sentry duty. For the rest still labouring, Nehemiah gives them a sword to wear at their side or to carry in their hand, whilst they still carry their building tools. What might that look like for us today? It's clearly not appropriate for Christians to have whatever uh, tools they need to do their job in one hand and an actual weapon in the other, certainly not in our circumstances anyway. But if we remind ourselves, thinking of the famous image given to us by St Paul in Ephesians chapter 6, that our primary battle is against spiritual forces, the powers and principalities of this world, then we need spiritual weaponry. We carry not a sword of iron, but wear spiritual armour and carry spiritual weapons. The shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit. So as we work with our trowel and our sword, that of the spirit, at our hands, we're called to build God's kingdom and his church as we pray. So Nehemiah prays. And Nehemiah acts, and his actions are firstly to remind the people of God and of all that he has done for them. Secondly, Nehemiah places sentries on duty, arms them fully, and gives the builders themselves additional weapons with which to fight off the enemy. And thirdly, Nehemiah keeps the people together. In verse 22, we see that some of the villagers near Jerusalem had been offering to put up some of the builders. But Nehemiah, conscious that these villagers were exactly the same people who'd been trying to discourage the wall builders, so there was huge scope for these uh, workers to have their confidence sapped if they were to mingle with these naysayers in much less Spartan surroundings than Jerusalem. Nehemiah insists that all the people of the city are to spend the night in Jerusalem, all together in the same place. Don't spend the night in a comfy village over there with your friends. We need you here, with us. We need to stick together as a church, united, especially when we're faced with opposition to our work to build the kingdom, guarding each other, fighting alongside each other, fighting for each other. The story of Nehemiah gives us some incredibly practical lessons for what to do when we're faced in our walk with Christ by opposition and discouragement. When we seek to take spiritual ground for the kingdom of God, we can almost certainly expect spiritual opposition. And the greater the danger that we represent to the enemy, the greater the opposition is likely to be. So as we continue in our benefice vision setting process over these coming weeks, dreaming together of how we can shine the light of Christ more brightly in our Cranmer group communities and grow together in our faith and discipleship, it would be no surprise if we were to face opposition from the enemy. But if and when we do, let us respond with the wisdom of Nehemiah. Let us respond with the faith of Nehemiah, first in active prayer and then in prayerful action, reminding ourselves of what God has already done before us arming ourselves with all of the spiritual weapons that the Lord gives us and unifying ourselves every step of the way. And in so doing, may we do wonderful things and bring people to Christ, to God's glory, in this, our Cranmer group of villages and parishes. In Jesus' mighty name I pray this. Amen. Patrick Newton is kindly going to lead us now in our intercessions. Thank you, Patrick. Let's bow our heads and pray to our Heavenly Father. 
Lord, we come to you now, confident that you listen to our prayers and provide all our needs. We start by praising you for your creation, for the wonders of the world all around us, for day and night, for light and dark, and the joy of life that is starting to respond to the change in the seasons. Thank you for sending your only Son to save us, and for all that he taught us in his time on earth. Thank you for sending your Holy Spirit that breathes life into our faith and gives us strength when days are tough. We think of your church on earth and ask that you bless the Queen, our Archbishop and Bishops and other leaders of your church and give them wisdom to guide your faithful. We pray for your church in the Cranmer Group for Tim, our vicar, and all who support your faith in the villages. We especially pray in the coming weeks as we come together to explore and pray for a vision for our churches in this group and for a way forward to grow the knowledge and love of you in this area. Give us the courage to imagine how we could facilitate a thriving Christian community here. Almighty God, we recognise this will not be achieved through our own efforts, but only as a group receiving your inspiration and support. We thank you for Tim's words today and for Nehemiah and his example as he responded to his enemy's opposition to his plans with prayer, work, vigilance, and focus on the Lord. May we also respond that way in the challenging months and years ahead as we fulfil your vision for the Cranmer Group. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the encouragement and hope we are all feeling from the successful vaccination programme. We continue to remember all those who have died from COVID and for the many lives that have been fractured by this crisis. We thank you for the hard work of the NHS and care workers and for those who developed vaccines. We pray that our country may carefully return to a normal way of life, but also maintain the positive connections that have been made between people and communities as we have supported each other through the pandemic. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. We think of the world at this time of crisis. We ask for your help in healing divisions and inequalities. We pray for wisdom and generosity for our world leaders so that they work together closely to solve the COVID pandemic and the cri climate crisis as well, but also to support poorer countries that they need medical and vaccination support. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our children as they return to nursery, school and college next week. Give them confidence that they are safe and help them to enjoy finally meeting up with their friends and starting to live a more normal life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are ill in our villages. Help them to access all the support they need. Hear us in a moment of quiet now as we remember all those who have died. Grant us with them a share in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Help us to have the courage to awaken to greater truth, greater humility and greater care for one another. May we place our hope in what matters and what lasts, trusting in your eternal presence and love. Merciful God, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. 
And now the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Patrick. The Collect for today, the third Sunday of Lent, from the Book of Common Prayer. We beseech thee, Almighty God, look upon the hearty desires of thy humble servants, and stretch forth the right hand of thy majesty, to be our defence against all our enemies. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Deborah Davis is now going to play for us the wonderful uplifting hymn, Christ is Made the Sure Foundation, thinking of Nehemiah and his foundation stones in Jerusalem. We look to Christ as our sure foundation. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you so much, Deborah. I'll bring our service to a close in a moment, but first a couple of brief notices. First of all, do join us for our First Things intercessory prayer this evening, Sunday, at 8pm on Zoom. 
We'll particularly be praying this time for our vision for the Cranmer Group Benefice that we're thinking about, reflecting upon and praying into at this time. Details of how to join are on the Benefice website. I look forward very much to seeing you there. And secondly, do please keep your amazing donations coming for the Cranmer Food Hub. We continue to support a number of individuals and families within our communities who are really struggling at this time. Donations continue to be so welcome. Do drop them off at your local church. We are pretty much uh, in need of anything and everything at the moment, as long as it's uh, non-perishable, of course. Uh, no particular requests at this time. And I think we've even perhaps got our stocks of baked beans down to a, a lower level than was the case previously. Thank you all so much for your generosity uh, in supporting our friends and neighbours in that way. I'll bring our service to a close with a blessing. Christ give you the grace to grow in holiness to deny yourselves, take up your cross and follow him. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you and those you love always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Go well, be blessed, have a good week. Do join us on Zoom at 10.45 if you're watching this on Sunday morning. Take great care. Thank you for joining us today and goodbye.